Welcome to EV Hub Live. EV Hub Live is a live video podcast for public policy professionals working to advance transportation electrification. EV Hub Live is recorded live, so to tune in and ask questions or check the schedule, please visit atlasevhub.com slash live. In this episode of EV Hub Live, Nick Nigro will sit down with Michael Barabee, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Transportation at the U.S. Department of Energy, and Joe Britton, the Executive Director of the newly formed Zero Emission Transportation Alliance. We'll be discussing vehicle and charging technology progress we can expect in the near term and the importance of U.S. leadership in electric transportation. This episode is produced by Peter Benzoni and Connor Smith, analysis from Nicole Laprie, all of Atlas Public Policy. Thanks, Peter. Uh, sorry about the little technical glitch, folks. Um, Teams uh, was giving us a bit of trouble. Uh, so one of our guests, Michael, is going to be dying. Uh, so we won't get to see his pretty face today. But um, but we still get his access to his big brain for, for a little bit. Uh, so I'm very excited about this episode, not only to talk to Michael, but also to Joe Britton, the new uh, ED of, of Zeta, and find out more about what that organization is about, what they're going to try to do in Washington. Uh, before we get to the conversation, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Nicole Lepre of Atlas Public Policy to give a quick update on the market. Nicole? All right, thanks, Nick. Um, so we have the slide up. Great. On EV Hub, we're tracking 61 new EV models that will become available in the United States by the end of 2025. BMW leads with six upcoming models, followed closely by Audi, Mercedes Benz, and Volkswagen, each with four or more upcoming models. Globally, automakers have made commitments to manufacture hundreds of EV models this decade, but the exact timing on these releases is not always clear. In the U.S., GM is a leader with plans to spend $27 billion to bring 30 new EV models to market over the next five years. Ford is also stepping up and plans to spend $11.5 billion globally through 2022. Ford's planned EV models include the e-transit van and an electric F-150, their best-selling gas vehicle. Across the auto industry, plans are in motion to invest more than $23 billion in U.S. manufacturing facilities to build EVs. And Peter, you can jump to the next one. Great. In policy news, GM and Nissan announced that they would pull out of the Trump administration's efforts to revoke California's ability to set more stringent standards for tailpipe emissions than the federal standards. The move is a strong signal that the auto industry is moving toward a less adversarial posture with California and the states and a return to the consensus approach taken with the Obama administration. Other support of EV policy news includes California's adoption back in June of the Advanced Clean Truck and Bus Rule, which calls for 100% of truck and bus sales to be zero emission vehicles by 2045. And in late September, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed an executive order calling for 100% of new passenger vehicle sales to be electric by 2035. Back to you, Nick. Thanks, Nicole. So we're going to start with you, Michael, uh, and I'd love to know more about your perspective on the federal government's role in supporting battery technology and EVs. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on, Nick. Uh, you know, we at at DOE and, and the federal government, uh, even at a larger level, have been, I would say, not only a national but global driver in the advancement of battery technology for over. Uh, over a decade now, the, the current lithium-ion batteries that you see in pretty much every EV uh, across the world has been uh, pioneered through the DOE research, which um, which is great. Uh, but there's a lot of progress yet yet to be made. Um, we're working aggressively to get costs down further, to get energy density up, which is both a cost and a, and a weight and a range range issue. Um, and we see great progress uh, going forward. So. Uh, love through the conversation here to share more of that with you and your listeners. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Joe, what is Zeta and uh, who's in it and what are you trying to do here in DC? Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me on. We are 
37 companies now. We started with uh, 28 on our launch, and so we've been growing uh, over the last couple of weeks. But the Zero Emission Transportation Association is a collection of manufacturers, battery folks, uh, supply chain, charging, and then utility interests that have come together to accelerate the transition to EVs. And, you know, really we're focused on kind of five key policies. One is consumer incentives. Uh, two is infrastructure investments, um, then three is support for state and locals uh, as they deploy that infrastructure, which is both convening and resources. And then, you know, support for domestic manufacturing, which I know we'll talk a little bit about today, certainly in the battery space. Um, and those are all kind of the carrots. We obviously feel, um, you know, our fifth bullet is that we think we ought to go back to strong uh, fuel efficiency and greenhouse gas uh, standards to send the right market signal um, that we're moving. And this is a 10 or 15 year transition and not a 40 or 50 year transition. So that's that's what brings all these uh, interests together and kind of diverse stakeholders to convince the federal government to uh, um, help us move along. And I think that is a, a nice pairing with what DOE has done on the research and, and kind of commercialization side is to, you know, put in place the federal incentives to, you know, create an ecosystem where consumers and charging build out and the manufacturing is there to accelerate the transition. So speaking of the federal government and the role in, in Washington here, uh, another trade association, the Auto Innovators, just is putting out a report. I believe it's coming out like right now. Uh, and, you know, on EV Hub Live, we always try to want to be timely. Uh, and so they they are urging the U.S. government to support EVs, EV charging, R&D, very similar, Joe, to what I, th I hear you saying. Uh, and so I wonder, what, do you, what does it say to you, uh, Joe, and then we'll turn it to Michael, that uh, the the largest uh, association of these auto, traditional automakers, let's call them, uh, is 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 pushing for this investments as well. Well, I think it's a good thing. I mean, we're cheering them on. We want them to make a lot of vehicles, and we want them to be successful doing it. And so, I think when there's a, a scrum over, you know, who is going to be more forward leaning into the you know electrification of the transportation sector, I think that's a that's a win for everybody. Michael, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I you know I I agree completely, and I you know just reading a few of the headlines of what they're talking about, certainly support for increasing R and D um, I think is is right on point. You know, while we've made a lot of progress, we're not there yet. Uh, but we see you know at this point we see line of sight out into uh, 2028, 2030 when you actually have you know a full range of vehicles that can be. Uh, electrified vehicles that are as cost effective, more cost effective than their ICE counterparts due to you know battery costs, electric drive costs coming down. Um, and when you have that, you have just right a tremendous tipping point because now you have a product that is, you know, I think by anyone who's driven EVs will say it's a great product, it's a great experience. And if you actually have it where it's economically better, um, you see kind of a switch over to, to mass adoption. So there's, in my mind, there's two two critical things that have to be happening simultaneously. We have to keep pushing hard on the battery technology, uh, to both to make sure we get there, as well as to make sure the U.S. maintains a technological leadership. Uh, and then we have to, in parallel, be doing all of the other things to get to EVs at scale, to make sure we have the grid aligned to be able to handle larger numbers of EVs, to make sure we have the charging infrastructure there, to make sure we have the recycling infrastructure so that we have the uh, the supply chain of those raw materials, um, you know, coming in. Because without that, you know, one, you'll have a cost issue if you don't have the right raw materials, don't have enough supply there, but you'll also have a, a new dependency issue, which no one wants to see. Right on. So so we're showing this uh, chart from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. They they do a, a survey annually of, of pricing on batteries. And they're just about to come out with their latest uh, for 2020. And what it's showing is kind of what what you all what you all are saying in that the prices are coming down considerably. They've obviously come down a lot in the last 10 years, but they're coming down. They continue to come down. Uh, some it looks like their 2020 figure is about $135 per kilowatt hour, which is down from well over a thousand uh, 10 years ago. So we're on the way. Uh, you know, Michael, you sound optimistic about battery price declines. General Motors uh, with their uh, Ultium product and Tesla with their big battery day a few months ago all seem to be equally optimistic. Uh, Michael, tell us about these major automakers uh, and their announcements. 
it sounds like you're on board with them, but how does the DOE uh, or what's the DOE's role in, in helping these companies achieve these goals? We um, we started a consortium called USABC, United States Advanced Battery Consortium, uh, probably about uh, I'd say six seven years ago, where we work very closely um, with the with the, really the time Detroit, Detroit three automakers on the most cutting edge technology. Um, we also have relations with other battery makers through a few other efforts as well, and so I think. There's um, a pretty tight ecosystem there. I think we're all pretty aligned on the technologies. Um, I think an important thing for people to know is it's not just a matter of, hey, keep building more and the cost will come down. Um, there actually are new chemistries and new technologies that I think we all believe are needed. You heard a lot of stuff in the news in the last few days on solid state batteries, uh, some announcement Toyota saying they'll have prototypes out there and plan to have a production car out there. So you think um, they can do this? Batteries. So you think um, they can do this? I, yeah, we know the technology. Um, we think solid state batteries will very likely be a critical part. The problem is kind of being able to manufacture them um, well at scale. It's really hard to make these uh, with good quality. So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see different people starting to come out with them. Um, there'll be some challenges initially, but you know that's how we learn, right? You got to start with low volume and get to higher volume. So solid mm -hmm. state is one, but also going to um, lithium sulfur um, or lithium metal type batteries, uh, increasing the silicon content, the anode. There, there are a number of chemistry items as well as how you make the batteries that will need to change and adjust over the next 10 years to get down to that you know, 80 to $100 level, that, that magic level where you get there and you're actually as cost effective as an IC, uh, IC vehicle. Hey Joe, so to bring on uh, Zeta here, and how, what does this all mean for, for achieving the goals of your organization? Well, I think one of the things that's different about Zeta is we're trying to take a, a building block approach. So instead of a ZEV mandate or a gas powered car ban, we're trying to put in place the pieces to help us get there. And so to do that, you need to obviously have, you know, consumer buy-in, consumer incentives, charging infrastructure build out and the things that make this good for every community. And so as the, you know, as the battery cost comes down, it's just a game changer, and I and I think you know Mike alluded to the hundred dollar you know per kilowatt hour level. I think there's folks that think that you know we'll get down to seventy five or fifty dollars per kilowatt hour, and the and Michael, you were referencing the you know the quantum scape announcement that came a couple days ago, and and I know JB, one of the Tesla co-founders, had really positive reviews and and felt like that was a huge breakthrough. So all of these things are I think you know creating an arc where. You know, we already could tell a story about how this is good for the consumer. It saves them on, you know, fuel and maintenance costs. But if we can get that battery pack cost down from, you know, the, you know, right now it's, you know, over ten thousand dollars just for the battery pack. If we can get that down, it starts to make the economics on the consumer side just dramatically better. So until we get that to that point, which might come really soon for some autos, uh, sooner than others, uh, I think we've got to look at, or at least the industry is looking at, banging that total cost of ownership drum. Uh, so tell me about where you both are at with that, and who are the who are the key audiences that you think will receive uh, receive that message on total cost of ownership? Uh, Michael, why don't we start with you? Yeah, and um, there's a chart, I don't know, Peter, if you can pull it up, that um, is a study that we have just completed on for light duty vehicles, life cycle maintenance cost. And we looked at all aspects of maintenance cost and bottom line is when you compare a BEV to an uh, IC uh, vehicle, internal combustion vehicle, there's six six thousand dollars of lifetime maintenance cost savings with a BEV. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty substantial, and I think it plays at a few different levels. Clearly, mm -hmm. that savings happens, you know, some of it later in life. Um, it also is uh, going to be larger for people that have more miles. So, I think you're going to start seeing people who are doing you know, medium-duty vehicles, vehicles that are driving a lot of miles, fleets, maybe light-duty fleets. Any Anyone who's driving a lot, a lot of miles, the EV, both for maintenance cost as well as the actual fuel cost, makes the payoff a lot quicker. So you're going to see adoption by those groups sooner, I think. Uh, but just to the average consumer as well, when they think, boy, $6,000 over the life lifetime. Now, some of that will be later in the life, but still that just as a first number, um, 
you know, I think going to be impressive to people and will also help people get over that, that hump while the upfront cost may be a little higher. So, Joe, let's turn it over to you, too, and talk a little bit about that total cost of ownership case that you need to make, what your members are trying to do. And maybe, you know, talk about a little bit of the some of your members that are working outside the, the passenger vehicle space uh, and some of those folks who might uh, be able to target fleets. Yeah, so, well, I think this, you know, obviously the fleet buyers, they, you know, they're going to run the regression on this. They'll be able to see the savings up front and have kind of the, you know, net present value of what they think the total cost of ownership will be. So they're looking at it. And I think even today it makes common sense. I think one of the things that, you know, I'm eager to see is the endurance pickup roll off the line at Lordstown because, mm -hmm. you know, while they could, you know, they could meet the like Ford F-150 market, it's really designed for, you know, the work site. And I think it'll not only... I think provide you know the you know kind of the commercial developers that are going to be buying the pickup with savings, but I think it's actually going to really break down some of the cultural barriers that we currently face with EVs. I think you know sometimes when people hear an electric vehicle, you know they think of the Nissan Leaf, and you know there's obviously a host of other use cases. And so I think when you're looking at either the Lords Towns or if you go up to you know the school buses, the Proterra, uh, the Arrival, the Transit folks. Um, there's, you know, these are the these are the fleet buyers that are, I think going to be the first movers. I think a lot of times people think that the medium and heavy duty side is further away. I actually think that might be the big catalyst surprise that we see in the next five years is that the fleet buyers make the transition quicker than the retail consumers. Yeah, I will I, make it. If I can oh, jump, go ahead, Michael. I was going to jump in. I, I think Joe is, is spot on in a few points there. That you no, know, they will be the first ones and. Don't underestimate how that socialization of the technology becomes important, whether you see the, you know, the UPS, Amazon, FedEx truck pulling up that's electric. Um, you're, you know, someone who works in that that industry and you get that experience and you hear people say, yeah, these things actually work really great and they, they pay off and that will make make a difference for sure. And um, just maybe one other quick thought on that. It, it, I think it actually extends up into large vehicles that, just four or five years ago, people said you can't really electrify a class seven or eight truck, but there's been a tremendous change where the average trip length for these class seven and eight trucks has been dropping a lot. People have been trying to keep their drivers at home. They're moving to a hub and spoke system. We've recently, you know, as we looked at the data, we looked at 50% of all goods on trucks move less than 100 miles from origin to destination. 75% mm -hmm. move less than 250 miles. So you think about that, there's a good number of those class seven, eight trucks, the delivery trucks that are actually delivering beverages or other things in and out of cities. They're back at home, if you will, they're home at night where they can charge at, you know, not a true aggressive power rates. Um, those will also make sense, you know, probably before some, you know, uh, some light duty cases. And Nick, I want to jump in here because the thing that, that Michael said, I think is worth noting is when you think about the total cost of ownership, you know, a lot of that cost accrues in the latter half of the life of the vehicle. And I think that's one thing that's really important to think about is right now, you know, we have about 17 million new car sales in the U.S., but we have nearly double that when it comes to used car sales. And so I think unlocking the secondary market and making sure that there's EVs there for secondary market buyers is really important. And if you think about the total cost of ownership, if you're buying a five to 10 year old ICE vehicle versus a five to 10 year old EV, I think you might see an even more dramatic delta between the cost that would be borne by the consumer on maintenance and service within the, in the secondary market. So I think that's something that, you know, we're hoping the, the federal government will help us, you know, provide a consumer incentive, but there's a couple other things that they can do. And one is unlocking the EV uh, rental market. So obviously, you know, the more that the rental car companies are putting these, these um, uh, EVs in their fleets, the more you're turning those over into the secondary market. There's also some incentives and work that we can do to, you know, deploy additional leasing. Uh, so those are all ways that I think we can prime the secondary market. And I think that secondary market is going to be a key pl place where a lot of people are going to accrue the maintenance and service savings, um, you know, certainly compared to your, your traditional gas powered car. It's really interesting, Joe, that you bring up uh, used cars in that way uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, a lot of people working in this industry um, have, I think, in the early days at least, have struggled to talk about how how electrification really will reach all segments of society. And, you know, now that we have electric vehicles, passenger vehicles, anyhow, that have much longer range, when they make their way into the used market, 
I think that that latter half total cost of ownership savings that you all are talking about is really going to resonate with them. You know, I'm thinking back to my first uh, car when I was a kid, an 85 Dodge Lancer. That thing was a, you know, a POS. I had to fix it constantly. Everything fell off of it and every moving part broke. Uh, and so it, it, it's um, it's exciting to think what what might be possible with the with the used market uh, in the near future. Um, we got you guys have been talking about other vehicle segments, which I like talking about some of the medium heavy duty parts, uh, Michael, particularly the, the the short haul delivery. I'm sure maybe you guys saw the uh, Rivian's uh, prototype that's on the on the road now. Uh, looks like their Amazon delivery truck uh, is is starting to get ready. That's that I think is very exciting for the industry. Um, but I also wonder about other segments like transit buses, school buses. Uh, could you speak a little bit to, um, you know, when when is electrification going to come to them? I think it's already here in the transit bus case, but there are other uh, segments that that we haven't quite yet reached. Why don't we why don't we start with you, Michael? Yeah, I think that, you know transit bus. Um, if you talk to the people who are the bus makers, and you talk, you know, these buses are typically ordered well in advance uh, on a replacement cycle, so they look at their forward-looking orders. Uh, I haven't checked in with them in the last year, but even a year ago, those forward-looking orders were pretty high percent EVs, uh, and that's only going to grow. And you know, when I talk to people just here in the DC area who had one of the first, you know, uh, fleets of EVs, they basically sold it on the economics uh, back, and that was, you know, uh, probably a few years ago they had to sell it to the city, and basically said, "Look, we think this is going to be about break even, and it only gets better over time." Uh, and they're, you know, they're just charging at uh, not any super fast charging rate that the vehicle sit overnight. So I think it it opened a lot of people's eyes. Um, you get, you know, a lot of places that are in colder climates that have a little bit of a challenge because of the range when it's really cold climate. So that's actually something I think it's a practical issue. But if we could work to get, you know, better heaters or, or figure out how to heat the buses more efficiently, then um, you can open up a whole bunch of other markets. Joe. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that sometimes people forget is that, you know, Proterra has been around, um, you know, selling, you know, these transit buses for, you know, longer than Tesla. And so, you know, they're an incumbent at, at this point, and they're, they've done a great job, I think, you know, going into these municipalities and transit agencies and making the economic case. And that's, you know, that's how you've got to win people over. I think right now, Honestly, the biggest struggle is going to be the the uh, you know financial shortfall that a lot of these folks are in. So I think, you know, the more that you know we see the federal government invest in in state and local fiscal relief, I think that will that'll be the tailwind that we need to really you know see deployment. I think you know, like Michael said, the economics are already there to you know to to deploy EVs. I kind of worry about whether or not they're going to have money for acquisitions. Period in the short run. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's something that Congress can certainly do, and, and I think you know, progressive and conservative communities are going to their legislators this week and saying how important that is. Yeah, our own research on fleet electrification, we just finished a study for the state of Washington, kind of showed that there's a lot of savings, particularly in the transit uh, bus space and passenger vehicle space, sedans, uh, in the very near term. And you can imagine pub local governments, state governments, uh, looking at least cost options. Uh, some years ago, you know, there was a lead by example uh, sort of uh, trend in the in the government space uh, for EVs, uh, and they were they were loss leaders. You know, they were losing money on those vehicles. Uh, it's exciting to think about uh, EVs now being sort of more economical, logical choice, particularly in the in the you know the current fiscal climate that we face. Um, let's let's switch, switch gears a bit and talk a, about charging. Um, so we've got 350 kilowatt charging stations being deployed now for passenger vehicles in, in some by some companies like Electrify America and such around the country. I will say back when we EVs started 10, 12 years ago, you know, we were talking about the nearest charging station is the outlet in your wall. And now we're at 350 kilowatts. You know, Michael, let's start with you. And when when do you think car companies are going to have vehicles out on the road that can charge at that rate? And you know, how important are these kind of fast charging networks as a backbone in in the EV market? Yeah, 
fast charging um, is absolutely going to be important. And like you said, it's um, maybe backbone isn't quite the right word. That kind of suggests it's the maybe the core, the bulk of it. I think the the plug uh, in your house is still going to be the backbone. That's going to be where most of the electrons flow to your EVs. But um, it's an important part of the of can't quite think of the right uh, anatomy analogy here, but for the overall system. You can call them a femur if you want. Or, That's fine. Yeah, maybe a femur there. Maybe the uh, thinking more like the veins, if you will, thinking about the highway network map. But <laughs> yeah. it, it's a confidence builder for people, um, and it's the imperative use. You know, it, it may only happen twice a year, but if it if two, twice a year you have to have it, that's an imperative use, and people will make purchase decisions based on that. Um, you know, when, but I think the bigger question is how fast do you really need? I think the, the 350, 400 kilowatt and, and faster, um, you know, some of those like larger batteries, bigger trucks, there's maybe an argument there. For the average consumer, you know, the question is going to be, okay, for the number of times I do that, the cost of the battery technology that gets there, because there is a trade-off in some battery technologies in terms of how fast it can charge. Um, so I think that's still a little TBD. Um, on on when you have that being there. And the other big thing I will say is, as we develop those fast charging networks, even though we know people, many people will be able to get almost all the electrons from home, the question is going to be, if the fast chargers are there and it's convenient, do people utilize them anyway? Even though they don't quote unquote need it, they're going to do whatever is easiest and most practical for them, um, which could become a bit of a bottleneck, right? Because then maybe you have other people who I, they really need it. They don't have a charging at home and that's their only option. So how do you how do you prioritize that? How do you manage it? It's kind of like this, uh, what I consider the messy middle. Like it'll be easier to see the long term. You can see where we are today. There's definitely gonna be this messy middle as we're deploying new technology and the technology across the vehicles is varying. So to me, that's maybe one of the biggest things we need to focus on is how do you manage that next 10, 15 years um, so that it's a, a positive experience and that um, something that accelerates deployment versus slows it down. Joe, give us Zeta's uh, position on on fast charging infrastructure networks, that kind of thing. So we actually did an analysis, and I think you know what we see is that you know seventy percent of charging is still going to be at home, but that's you know I think gives us a target then for the federal government to you know help close the gap and. And I think, you know, we, you know, think that, you know, if we're at 100% electric vehicle sales by 2030, we're going to need about 4 million, um, you know, light duty charging units, and then, you know, another 400,000 on the medium and heavy duty side. And I think, you know, the benchmark that we've kind of just said of what we expect between kind of L2, you know, your sub 50, and then your, you know, your north of 50 direct current fast charging is about 90, 10. So I think, you know, we, we sense that about 10% of those, um, you know, non-resi charging will need to be DC fast charging. And so, you know, it is a huge, you know, psychological element and a cultural element. You know, I think people still envision, you know, that, you know, road trip to grandma's house for Thanksgiving and, you know, is their car going to be able to to get them there? And I, like Michael said, like unlocking that and providing, you know, an assurance that, you know, that fast charging is going to be there, I think is huge. Um, the other thing I think people, you know, sometimes, you know, lose track of, which I think is important to remind folks is, you know, by the time that you, you know, you stop, you grab a bite to eat, you're using the restroom, you know, you're there for 20 or 30 minutes in the gas station anyway, on those long road trips, and you can be at an 80% charge, uh, with many cars, I think that's only going to get better. So, you know, I think people still have this aversion to, you know, what about that cross-country trip? But you know, the technology is closing that gap. Those cars are coming, and that and the network's being built out. And I think you know, you see a, you know, EVgo and ChargePoint and EV Box and a host of these companies making it commercially viable to be in that space. And um, you know, so I think this is a success story in the waiting. Speaking of six, other... oh, go ahead, Michael. Well, yeah, if I can just maybe add in, um, I actually think there's another, let's say, a risk side that doesn't get talked about quite as much as you know, we talk about the fast charging and how much you need there. But um, we recently did a study uh, at NREL, and it took a few years to really get a solid understanding of who has charging where they park their car at night and who doesn't, and, and you know the different population groups in that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, Peter, if you want to pull up a chart or not, but it, uh, I think I sent over. Um, what, again, this data doesn't, didn't exist anywhere. We had to stitch it together from a number of sources and then do some surveys. At the end of the day, um, 
in a complicated travel area. So it was, when you get out to 100% penetration, so if you looked at you know the total population, about 50% of people can charge at, let's say, home, where they park their car at night. They might need some added equipment. Maybe then they're going to make, need to make a little bit of an investment there, but that's, you know, that is doable. There's 25% of people where that would be true, but they'd have to change their behavior. Think of all the people that live in urban areas that park. They have a garage, but they mm -hmm. uh, park out front. Or, you know, a lot of people in suburbs that have a garage that's full of junk. They can't fit their car in there. You know, they're parking out of the driveway. So, you know, they'll have to change behavior. Maybe that, you know, can be done. But then there's another 25% of people that just really have no option for home charging. So for that group of folks, how do you, you know, how do you address those needs? Is it fast charging during the day? Is it, you know, workplace charging? Maybe that's true at some point, or is it basically deploying more community-based charging where they have something that's not directly tied to their home, but available to them in the community? And I think we need to start focusing on that population group uh, as well. Yeah, Nick, I would I would echo that too. I think you've got the Carper Alexander bill, which makes a you know down payment on some of those other use cases. But I think ultimately what we need to close the gap is you know you're going to have on street, you're going to have multi unit, you're going to have you know other retail charging. I think you know if you look around the country, there's a lot of uh, level two at at, uh, at grocery stores. You know you're going to be in there for 40 minutes. You you come out, you've got a full charge. I think those are the sort of things that you know, can supplement what Michael's describing. I think we see, you know, the numbers in the same way. You know, this is something that's doable, but, you know, I think we've got a public interest and a public policy argument for a federal investment here to help get home on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know, sitting here in D.C. We park on the street. My neighbors park on the street. They've actually, they know I work in EVs and they ask me, when am I going to be able to charge my car? I'm not going to drag an extension cord out into the street. And so, you know, I'm looking at you, Pepco, uh, to, to come up with some solutions here uh, for for the residents here in the in the nation's capital, because um, I think there's some people who would be looking more at EVs, especially with the offerings we have today, if there was a reasonable home charging solution. Well, Nick, um, I don't know if you noticed, but two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a, a bank of uh, fast chargers that were put in at the uh, South Dakota Avenue Home Depot slash Lowe's slash Costco oh, yeah. up mm -hmm. there. So you, you do have an option. You, you know, running errands on the weekend, you've got yeah. you've got a place to go. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so last topic uh, for today, competitiveness. Uh, you know, we started at what's the federal government's role, and I think we're going to end with you know the the multinational companies and how we're trying to attract more of that money that they're supposed to be investing in EVs here in the United States. Now, we just had an election. We certainly have some changes coming to Washington. Uh, priorities will shift. All evidence points to that. Uh, but in the last few years, you know, America or the United States, we fell behind EU and China on EVs. So we have work to do. It's clear at this point. Uh, so first to Michael, how important it is for, is, is it for, for the U.S. to be a leader in transportation electrification from an economics, environmental, you know, policy perspective? Uh, it, it is it is hugely important. I mean, the transportation sector and let's say automotive and, and trucking is just a huge economic driver. Um, you know, not only the OEMs, the suppliers, all the healthcare they provide. There's there's just a huge number of uh, employment related items there, and. It's clear that this uh, that entire industry is changing. Can debate how fast. And if we're not a leader there, we run the risk of losing a lot of that uh, economic capability and, and jobs. Um, I, so I'll I will say our um, our answer or part of what we're trying to do to address that is DOE led a consortium of federal agencies earlier this year to create the Federal Consortium on Advanced Batteries. Um, mm -hmm. This was across you know State Department, Department of Defense. Commerce Department, of course, DOE, EPA, you know, others, and it really to create a national strategy and how are we going to make sure that we have the entire supply chain and the economics that go with that, as well as the national security interests that go with that to be able to make the batteries of the future. Um, so a number of the, I, you know, Joe, I see a number of the Zeta members of those people that are involved in the critical minerals and materials and some of the mining pieces. Um, so how do we address that? How do we make sure that we have domestic processing? Many times it's the actual processing of those minerals that are critically important. 
um, all the way up through the actual manufacturing of the of the cells. So I would say keep an eye out for the uh, we say FCAB Federal Consortium on Advanced Batteries. I think they will play a critical role in helping to make sure we have a a whole of government approach and national strategy on on batteries and you know electrification more broadly. But batteries really is the critical piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say, you know, there's a couple programs that are already are really important. You've got the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program, ATVM. Um, that's one that you know I think needs to be expanded to the medium and heavy duty space. You saw in the last couple of weeks, actually, the Trump administration opened up some supply chain um, and processing projects as part of that, um, you know, the, the financing support that ATVM provides. So I actually think that's really important for us to go to the incoming administration and say, you know, the supply chain is just as important and funding, you know, development and advanced manufacturing through ATVM for the supply chain is is a critical piece. And and Michael actually mentioned the processing. I think, you know, in some ways that's the most important because that's, you know, that's where, you know, we've got other supply chain opportunities for lithium and cobalt. Uh, Gervais is actually developing a cobalt uh, you know, uh, mine here domestically. There's a host of lithium production in the Carolinas and in Nevada, um, but I know Livent and Albemarle in particular are looking to grow their processing domestically because that's really where the Chinese have supremacy. Um, even if we source it from somewhere else, a lot of the processing currently is done in China. So when Michael talked about you know, our national security and securing the supply chain, it's not just a question of, of, of materials, it's also our ability to you know prepare that for the battery cell, and so that's an area where I think we see a ton of opportunity. Some of the things that we're going to be asking the the administration to do is to create a an office of uh, of state EVSC support, so helping to deploy EVSC uh, infrastructure. I think you know this is something that could benefit the entire clean tech chain. Is an office of industrial transformation to ensure that as we decarbonize and have an economy that you know is is supporting these new kind of clean tech startup technologies that the economic development and the jobs accrue domestically is really really important for the i think culturally and for the political support that we need so there's a host of things that we can do to really secure a you know a domestic um, economic win and i think that's directly tied to our ability to go to congress and make a strong argument for why electrifying the transportation uh, sector and doing it in an accelerated way is a win for everybody. I think that's, you know, this is an opportunity. You know, you could come to EVs because you, you know, think it's good for the consumer and for fuel and maintenance costs and performance. You could come to this because you think it's the right thing to do for climate change and decarbonization. You could do it for public health. Um, but I think more importantly than anything is going to kind of diverse political interests and say, this is going to be a win for you and your community. I mean, you look at what Rivian's done. They've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in there. Uh, I think what was a former Mitsubishi plant, Lordstown has done that with the former Chevy Cruze plant. So they're creating thousands of jobs, investing hundreds of millions of dollars. And all of a sudden, you know, the predisposition that you might have as a member of Congress about EVs tends to evaporate. Once you know, once you see that kind of economic development, and I think we'll have a opportunity to show that we're creating jobs in every congressional district in the country. You know, it's been it's been a crap year for so many reasons uh, in 2020. Uh, and Joe, you really you really looking to turn it around for us right now with with an optimistic 2021. And I, you know, I'm. I'm on board. Uh, that's for sure. I, I I think you make a strong case there for for the value proposition for EVs. Uh, Michael, I'm going to leave it with you and let you close us out. What what's an optimistic uh, message you have for for our audience as we look to the end of the year holidays and and uh, uh, climbing out of this this pandemic in 2021? The uh, well, yeah, you know, I, I I share a lot of Joe's. Um, optimism and I you know while I'm the, the technology and R&D guy and I think that will be critically important it technology and R&D alone will not uh, get us there it's going to take uh, everyone working together and I I do believe um, this whole idea of diversification of the transportation industry is uh, is going to happen and grow and if we use that to our advantage just as you have now domestic manufacturing you have more dispersed manufacturing you maybe have a more robust transportation industry in the future. Um, 
the uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of years in Detroit, and Detroit uh, is uh, is a great place. The auto city is a great place, but there are a lot of other parts of the country that also support uh, transportation and automotive. And I think there's a lot of opportunity nationally uh, for this. And then just as we talked about the, the raw materials, the processing, all of that, that those are jobs, right? Those are domestic jobs in the processing, uh, or uh, actually in some cases maybe the mining of that raw material. So it. It will be important. I think we have to recognize the world is evolving and changing, and we want to be ahead of that curve. Um, I'd say on, on the optimistic note, I I really believe that we um, we are the leaders still on the technological front when it comes to a lot of the key technologies in, in electric vehicles. We may not be very far ahead, but we, we are ahead. Uh, we may not be selling the most vehicles, but I think on the technology side, we're a leader. So if we push hard, we can maintain that leadership and help translate that into strong, you know, domestic uh, job and economic opportunity as well. Message received loud and clear. Let's push in 2021. Uh, so I want to thank Michael Barabee and, and Joe Britton for, for joining us on EV Hub Live. Also want to thank Peter and Connor for producing and the sharp analysis from Nicole. Uh, We'll try to do another episode uh, next week if we can, but if not, uh, really appreciate everyone uh, listening to the show and hope everyone has safe and happy holidays and a happy new year. Thanks.